All right, let's make a start. Thanks everybody uh, for joining uh, this afternoon or this morning if you're on the West Coast. Um, what we're going to walk through today is um, CDW's plan in partnership with Palo Alto and VMware around modernizing applications. Um, again, if you have any questions uh, for us as we go, please uh, drop them in the uh, chat window and, uh, and Robert will help me get to them as we go. Again, please do ask any questions. Um, I do love the sound of my own voice, but it makes for a lot more interesting uh, uh, for everybody if there's, uh, if there's questions to answer. So with that, quick uh, shot at the agenda here. I, I, don't, I don't like agenda slides. I think they hold us to things um, that, that we may not uh, get to or that more importantly, um, keep us from getting to things we want to. So again, you use my hate of agenda slides to fire some, some questions at me um, as we go. But generally, we're gonna look at some of the common challenges our customers have, have brought to us. We're gonna look at what the path to modernization might look like, why you might be looking to modernize, um, why the partnership between uh, VMware, Palo Alto Networks and CDW, and one that is very near and dear to my heart, um, which is around um, uh, data sovereignty in the public cloud. So what are some of the common challenges that our customers have, have brought to us? If you look at this, um, it's, it's meant to look like um, dominoes for, for a good reason. Um, it all starts and ends with legacy infrastructure. Um, we, we all know that it's brittle, that it's causing us headaches, uh, sometimes worse heartburn. Um, and with that legacy uh, uh, infrastructure comes some in inherent security risks. We're all working under compressed timelines. It, 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 it doesn't feel anymore that we're working from home. It feels like we're living at work. And, and then finally, nobody's budget is, is getting bigger to deal with this. We, we, we need to find a way to stop really that first domino from, from falling and, and taking everything out with it. On top of that, um, this is what bits and pieces of your legacy infrastructure probably looks like. Um, there's, uh, you know, for some of you, there'll be mainframes. Some of you may have dipped your toe into, into containers and microservices. Uh, some of you may um, have reached out to different clouds to, to run uh, test and dev. And if you think in your organization that hasn't happened, that just means you don't know that it's happened. It's, it's happening everywhere under the old specter of shadow IT. Um, and then we look at, you know, off the shelf software, uh, different uh, 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 retail pieces of software we need to deal with, our, our, you know, different Java packages. There's a ton of stuff out there within our, uh, within our uh, infrastructure that we need to deal with and somehow pull it all together and, and modernize it. On top of that, when someone says cloud, it could mean any, all, or none of the things that are on the screen right now. Um, the, the, the problem again is that there's so many choices, um, it's hard to know which way to, which way to go. Um, I always say there's only two cho choices in life, uh, a freedom of choice or freedom from choice. And this is one of these situations where you'd almost be better off with freedom from choice um, if there was a clear way to get where you're at now to where you need to go. So in essence, what is app modernization? Um, it really boils down to one single thing in my mind. It, it's aligning what you have today, the legacy infrastructure and software that you have today and the, the application stacks that go with that, not only with your current business needs, but where you believe your business needs to go, where the business is telling you this is the direction we need to go. That's truly app modernization. So as we get talking to customers about this, the, the, the few brave souls that have started down this path already, uh, uh, some common threads uh, came through loud and clear. Their decision to modernize really started around one of four um, uh, challenges that they had. Either they had a challenge with their ability to scale, think, to, think back only a few months when we all went to work from home, um, and, and the difficulties in scaling around that uh, within your business, the, 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 
the long days and nights that you spent getting folks up to up to speed and being able to work, being able to get a hold of uh, uh, of the uh, um, equipment that you you needed to make that happen. Um, there's of course always you know security. We all know the old joke: you have no money for security until your first half, and then you have all the money in the world. Um, but legacy infrastructure is just that. Um, over time, we all know where the security holes are and, and where, the, where the weak spots in the armor are. So modernizing can, can help address some of our security problems. Um, simply the economics, it is getting more and more expensive to maintain legacy infrastructure. It's getting harder and harder to find the folks that can maintain it, especially if we look, we go back a few slides and look at mainframe. And then there's simply the speed of execution. Um, a lot of our customers say it was a wake up call when our, one of our competitors did X and, and we, we didn't even see that coming. And now we're on the back foot. We're looking for a way to leapfrog. So, as you start to think about your infrastructure around these, these four key components, you can start to see how over time this, as you modernize, you can unlock business value when you start to think about leading from the app application back as opposed to letting the infrastructure decide what the art of the possible was right think about what your journey to the cloud is and it truly is a journey um, this should absolutely be an evolution not a revolution revolutions are bloody you, you don't want that um, for those of you that are waiting for buzzword bingo we, we do have digital transformation uh, on the slide um, Digital transformation to me is like DevOps. If I ask 10 people what it is, I'll get 11 different answers. Um, doesn't mean any of those answers are wrong. Doesn't mean that all those answers are right. Um, but it's going to mean something different to everyone in the context of your organization. And finally, as we start this, this journey, we start to actually uh, modernize. We start to, we start to see the wins. It's very much a hockey stick effect. We start to see additional operational efficiency. We see how, how it's now possible to truly secure our perimeter. We're able to deal with government governance and compliance uh, significantly better. Um, uh, I read an article, I think the day before yesterday about uh, continuous compliance. Um, and that, that is a thing that is coming. So we need to, to think about how am I going to be compliant? How am I going to quickly react to the market? How am I quickly going to serve customers? And, and once you've modernized, you are significantly more uh, nimble and, and portable and, and able to, to address those things. Robert, any questions so far? No, nope, no question. No question so far, okay. I'll get more controversial then, that'll stir someone up to ask a question. So why would you modernize it all? There's a ton of reasons. Um, to me, the number one reason to modernize is probably about uh, around responding to customers. Um, customers, Canadian customers are absolutely expecting products and services to be delivered to them over the internet, period. Um, and and I, I think there's a few folks on today's call that are, are from the, uh, uh, from the public side of uh, uh, public sector, citizens are increasingly uh, expecting to have things delivered um, uh, uh, over the internet, and they expect it to be instant. We, we, we've all become used to instant gratification on our phones, and we all want things done quickly. If you if you're in the you know the FSI um, uh, sector, you know just how quickly uh, uh, some new fintech can appear and, and rattle things for you. Um, I spent 15 years in Europe and what I saw in companies leapfrogging and using technology to do it was, was simply amazing. Um, some of the other reasons is, you know, fiscal responsibility. We are now at a point um, where utility computing, what we used to call utility computing 25 years ago, is a, is a reality. We really can pay just for what we need build and knock down infrastructure as we need it and be significantly more cost effective in, in doing that. Um, it's certainly more efficient um, uh, to move to a modern infrastructure and it simplifies things. Um, 
you're on a pay, pay as you go. You're able to accelerate and support your, your devs and, and your DevOps infrastructure within your organizations. And that gives you portability. And portability is the, the uh, most important simplification, if you will. And I'll talk more about portability in a couple of slides. So, if you're in a position that says, okay, I, I, I fundamentally get that I, that, that I ought to modernize, that, that I need to start this journey, that, that there's things that need to be done, where do I start? So, it really breaks down into probably four buckets. Um, you start with use cases, um, and, and I really cannot stress this enough. You pick a few use cases, you build the muscles slowly, this is an evolution. Revolutions are bloody. You want an evolution. You want to build the muscles. In every single one of these uh, uh, these app, uh, app modernizations uh, that I've been in, involved in, and I'm thinking of companies like Nordea, um, SockGen in France, uh, KPN, which is the, the Dutch phone company, um, BMP Paribas, HSBC, they started slow. And they started slow so they could learn what they were doing and they could get a handle on things, but it's absolutely a, a hockey stick effect. The first few applications uh, took, you know, quite directly took, took, you know, 90 to 120 days to, to really get where they needed to be. After that, it, it, they, they, build, uh, they built uh, things that almost everyone, um, I think it was coined by the, the Finnish uh, uh, public tra uh, transit system, a, a software factory. And then they were able to, to, to take the, the old applications that they had and pump them out and break them down into microservices very quickly, very efficiently, and, and recycle what they needed and, and drop what they didn't. So critically important that you, you start as, a, as an evolution, but you'll see very quickly um, a, a hockey stick effect. So uh, you start with use cases. You, you determine what change management needs to go uh, into place to ensure that your software development folks are, are kept um, inside the, the, the bubble of that modernization, if you will. So typically, uh, the uh, internal dev falls on one of two sides. Either they're way ahead of ops and giving ops heartburn by throwing things over the, over the wall, or, or they are uh, not ahead of ops, they're sticking with the legacy infrastructure, but they're full of heartburn and full of frustration that, that they can't go faster. So you need to look at how um, how that's going to how what you plan to do is going to going to uh, affect your entire software supply chain. Um, obviously enough, the oldest cliche in IT: How do you change the engine on the plane while you're in air in the air? But you do need to be able to modernize without disruption. Again, that comes back to uh, going slowly, building the muscles, and, and uh, instigating an evolution, not, not a revolution. And then finally, and this is a giant bugbear for me, the public cloud and data sovereignty. Um, are your compliance um, uh, requirements being met in the cloud of your choice? Is it the right choice for you? Is it the right choice for your business? Is it the right choice for your government, if you if you happen to represent, you know, federal, um, provincial, or municipal government, um, uh, if you're a retailer, um, you pro there's a cloud you probably don't want to land on. Um, if you have concerns about your data uh, leaving your municipality or province, that there will be others that that you need to consider and, and be uh, certain that you're in the right place. That is critically important. Um, Often, with with a few exceptions, but often that gets lost in the shuffle, and it is critically, critically important. If anybody wants uh, any horror stories about that, reach out to me afterwards. I, I can tell you a ton of horror stories that uh, start in Belgium and, and uh, work their way north. So, when CDW looked at this and said, "All right, well." We, we, we've talked to enough customers um, to, to understand what the general challenges are we, we've got a, a solid understanding of ourselves of of what customers would need to move forward with this 
who can help the customers? And the answer was no one. No one company can solve this problem for you. There, there's lots of one companies that will show up and tell you that they can, but, but they simply do not, it simply doesn't exist. So we put together something that in the early days we called the Coalition of the Willing. And it was a partnership and, an, and is now a strong partnership with VMware Tanzu and Palo Alto Networks. Uh, VMware Tanzu, obviously enough for uh, VMware's Tanzu Kubernetes Grid and their platform and Palo Alto Networks for end-to-end uh, -end, um, cloud to uh, cloud to dev security. And I've got a quick, I call this our architecture slide. What you'll see here in the, in the middle is the application runtime itself. That's Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, and, and that use a, uses a container runtime with Kubernetes as the uh, uh, orchestrator. As you would expect from VMware, this is a VMware supported solution. So yes, it's, it's open source software, 100%. Is it, is it uh, blessed and fully supported by VMware? It absolutely is. You'll notice on the bottom, you'll see modern infrastructure and that says on-prem or in the cloud. What uh, TKG, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, uh, gives you is the ability that once your applications are, uh, have been moved to, to, Kuber, uh, to Kubernetes Grid, to TKG, you can move them to any cloud. One click through virtual center, leveraging the knowledge you already have around VMware, you already have around virtual center. So nobody has to run out and, and, uh, and get uh, retrained or, or, or start pulling their hair out or gnashing their, gnashing their uh, teeth. Um, this is building on the skill set that you already have in-house with VMware. Um, think it, it's identical. Um, uh, TKG is doing for the cloud what VMware did for physical hardware. We all have our own personal favorite um, physical hardware server manufacturer. And we all also know that it doesn't really matter because when it's virtualized, it doesn't matter whose name is on the front of the Intel box. Um, but I know we all, we all still have our favorites. I, I have mine too. Um, so I'll give you an example. If, if you were to, and I'm not picking on any particular cloud here, but if you were to refactor your applications to move them to AWS and for whatever reason, let, let me pick a random reason. Let's assume that you were Kroger Foods, one of the grocery chains in the um, United States, uh, based in Ohio, and you had uh, initially done your cloud move to Amazon uh, because that seemed like a good idea at the time. And then Amazon bought one of your competitors, Whole Foods, you would then need to do that entire lift and shift, that entire refactor all over again to move to a different cloud. However, if you're to move to, to TKG and you decide, okay, today I'm on AWS, but tomorrow I need to be on, on uh, uh, Azure for any reason whatsoever, uh, it might be, um, uh, financial, political, uh, 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 competitive. You can simply move um, uh, from TK, uh, using TKG, pardon me, from AWS to Azure or to Google or back on premise uh, uh, for any uh, machines that you may have on prem. Equally, uh, occasionally customers will tell me, well, look, I, I like the idea of this, but we're not allowed to go to the cloud yet. Um, I'm thinking of some of them. Um, now, I spoke to UHN uh, earlier this week, and they said, we really want to do this, but our uh, patient data is too critical, and, and we don't yet have permission to, to move it to the cloud, but what can we do to get ready? Equally, this gets you ready, because once you're on TKG, you can be sitting on premise and then decide later, I'm going to burst to the cloud, or I'm going to move to the cloud, or I'm going to sit tight, and when and when governance and regulations change, change, I will be able to to move to the cloud again, single click through through um, virtual center, uh, for through vCenter, pardon me. 
Now, um, on top of that, for those that have uh, uh, dev shops, of course, there's a full development framework for this. If you're, if you are folks that are uh, devs are ahead of the curve and they're already using Docker Desktop, for example, there's full integration with Docker uh, Desktop, and 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 that will work uh, uh, fine with TKG. We've got a customer now that that that's doing that currently. And then critically important here, because we can never forget about security, with Palo Alto Prisma, you have security at every single one of these layers, from the cloud right through um, the uh, uh, dev framework with integration into your CI CD pipeline, et cetera. And that's why we, we approached uh, uh, Palo Alto um, for this. There's a lot of good point solutions in security. Um, VMware uh, has some great um, security point solutions at different points on this, uh, uh, on this uh, framework, but only Palo Alto with Prisma has a solution, a rock solid solution um, at each one of these uh, uh, layers, which is why we, we uh, chose to work with them. Robert, I was controversial as I could be. Any, any questions so far? Still nothing. Still not, no, nobody wants to fight over AWS versus Azure or HP versus Dell. I guess not. All right. I'm also a Leafs fan. Maybe that'll stir things up. All right. Um, so why did we choose, uh, just to drill down a little bit, why did we choose Tanzu? Very simply, leverage the, uh, uh, the knowledge you have, leverage the investment you have, and transform the applications that you've got in the way that's right for you at your pace. Again, evolution, not revolution. Anyone who wants to go fast is probably going to go fast into the wall. Uh, I know that's not a. Uh, I know that's not a uh, um, popular opinion. I, I know the, the the our sales team wants to go fast, fast, fast. Let's do this, do this, do this. Let's not. Let's go slow and steady and, and get uh, get to the point where our our muscles have been built that we are then properly and uh, able to go fast. Uh, if you're if you're old like me, you'll you'll remember the old Midas commercials. For first we get good, then we get fast. Um, and again, VMware through through their acquisition of Pivotal, which if if you if you know your VMware history was a uh, Pivotal was a spin out of spin spun out of VMware and then spun back in a few years later. Um, they understand how to uh, modernize the right applications and, and how to mo uh, how to automate that in the correct way. So, so you're getting experience, support, um, uh, recycling, if you will, of the of the uh, uh, investment you have already made, both both in in training, ma uh, manpower, and and infrastructure. So, I Palo Alto. Um, I've been in this space for four years now, five years now. I started with Docker um, back in at the beginning of 2016. Um, security has always been an interesting challenge for containers. Um, I've worked with every security, a container security vendor out there in, in my journey with this. Nobody can touch Palo Alto. It, it, it's as simple and as complicated as that. Um, that that I know that will hopefully be controversial enough for some folks who've done some research. Um, somebody always has a contrarian opinion, but uh, the 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 uh, history bears it out. The the satisfied customers, the the customers that have gone down other paths and ended up in a bad way and and had to come back to Palo Alto, bear it out. They simply have the most solid uh, end to end solution. And they can protect you anywhere from from the uh, from the cloud again, right up to the to the development layer. But there just isn't anybody better. It's as simple and as complicated as that. So, and what does CDW bring to the table? Well, we bring to the table, uh, you know, uh, an experienced bench, um, a uh, a ton of uh, uh, professional services folks that are uh, up to speed on this that have been working in the DevOps space for a number of years now. Um, that have been uh, trained directly by VMware and Palo Alto in pulling all this together and actually bringing a, a solution uh, to customers. And we re really represent, uh, you know, the single uh, hand to shake and neck to break um, uh, at the end of the day. Um, 
And, uh, you know, for customers that, that, you know, may know us from, uh, you know, uh, our, our other lines of business, I would encourage you to take a look at what we're doing in this space, have a conversation with us, and uh, let's see where, again, we can start slow um, with you and, and build the, the evolution that gets uh, where you need to go. Um, quick bit on migrating to containers, right? Why do we um, migrate to containers? Uh, I get asked this, I, I've added these slides after my architecture slide. Um, once you've moved to containers and you're orchestrating with Kubernetes, scaling becomes on demand and as automated as you wish it to be. It's significantly more efficient because a container is significantly smaller than a VM. It can be instantiated in literal milliseconds. And, you know, we, we've got, uh, we've, I'll, I'll uh, pick a specific customer. We have a, uh, an insurance customer and they run with, uh, 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 with containers. They're sitting, uh, their applications, their customer facing applications are sitting on their data center. They're sitting on AWS and they're sitting on Azure all at the same time. Kubernetes manages them communicating amongst themselves. And if AWS or the data center or Azure becomes unavailable for any reason, Kubernetes will automatically scale them up where they need to be on any of the remaining resource that they have. So this is, this is the true self-healing that we've all been promised for so long. The, the true utility computing that we've all been promised for so long, it is finally here. We, we just all had to live long enough to see it. Um, once you're in a container, you are incredibly agile. I, I spoke to that earlier. You can lift and shift any container to any spot, and uh, it, it's a single click. You don't need to be concerned with will it work, um, uh, uh, you know, how long will it take to get it there, all that type of, uh, of thing goes away with containers. You have portability and full portability gives you full agility. And finally, uh, containers are inherently more secure. And then with the additional wrapper of, of uh, uh, Prisma, you have, a, you have as rock solid a solution as you can hope to have. We all know in this business, nothing is perfect. Robert, any questions so far? Uh, no questions. No questions. All right. Um, a quick shot here, and I, I, I mentioned about containers being more um, uh, more portable and more efficient. This is why, and I'll walk you through it. Um, if you if you work right to left with me um, this one time, you'll see on the uh, right hand side you have your infrastructure, and we all know that infrastructure can be whatever x86 and, and, you know, including cloud. You have a hypervisor on top of that, and then you have a virtual machine. And that virtual machine includes a full guest operating system and the application um, uh, itself. And then you can have so many of these per size of hypervisor. They, I, I worked at VMware pre-IPO. I started in 2006, so I left in 2014. When I, when I started, when we could, if we could get 10 VMs on, on a, a physical piece of hardware, we thought we were rock stars. N nowadays, it's obviously many more times that with the more powerful hardware. Um, but equally, you still need a full guest operating system. And that guest operating system comes with all of the things that a guest operating system needs. It needs someone to pay for it. It needs someone to update it. It needs someone to care for it. It needs someone to water it. Um, this is the classic example of, cat, uh, of pets. Each one of these uh, uh, VMs is somebody's pet that they have to take care of. Um, and we all know there's that person at the office that takes the, takes the pets more or less seriously than others, but they are literally pets. We have to look after them. If you look at the left-hand side and you see the containerized applications, again, we have infrastructure, which can be exactly the similar type of infrastructure. You've got a host operating system, um, typically. Now on the cloud, we don't need that. On-prem we do, but that's okay. On top of that, you would have a container engine. That could be Docker, that can be OCI, uh, uh, et cetera. 
On top of that container engine is the application, is just the application in the container and the binaries and libraries it needs to run. So if you look on the right hand side, one of those VMs will be, let, let's, let's pick, uh, I, I don't know, let's pick Ubuntu. Um, Ubuntu is going to be roughly uh, a 10, maybe minimum 10 gigabyte install. And then the, then the, uh, um, then the uh, uh, application itself on, on top of it. So let, let's call it, let's be super conservative and call it 11 um, uh, gigabytes. So the, if you get that, that same application running in a container is just the application and the binaries and libraries it needs. That'll be in tens of megabytes. Um, so you can see that there's a massive shift in the amount of processing power that, that it takes to spin something up that's, you know, 50 or 60 um, megabytes versus something that is 10 to, to 12 gigabytes. So you get significantly more um, uh, efficiency out of either the hardware or the, or the cloud um, capacity that you have. But because they're so small, um, they're, they're easy to move, they're easy to recreate, they're easy to recycle, and your dev teams want to recycle these things. They, they break them down into microservices and they recycle them. And when they recycle them, they don't need to rewrite code. When they don't need to rewrite code, they're able to go faster. The faster they can go, the quicker you can, you can leapfrog your competition. It's, uh, it, it, it all comes back to how small a unit uh, uh, a container is. So, Robert, any questions about that? No questions. All right, so everyone agrees that uh, uh, the Leafs are the best, they're gonna win this year. All right, fair enough. Um, that modernization journey. So we used to call these the five R's, um, but, but they've been split out to the six, six R's and I'll explain where the split happened. Um, as we know in IT, some of this is science and some of it is religion. Um, you either repurchase an application when you start to decide, okay, I've, I've got X applications, I need to do, I need to do something with my ABC widgets app. What do I do with the widgets app? You either repurchase it to use it in the cloud, which is unlikely, or you rehost it, and rehost it is lift it and shift it from where it's at, from your physical uh, infrastructure into the cloud, and that's uh, I call that the spray and pray method. And here's where the hair splitting comes in, or you replatform it. And I know what you're saying. What's the difference between rehost and replatform? I don't know either, um, except that replatform is when I lift it, I tweak it a little bit, and then I shift it. And and that's probably where about ninety percent of folks land in, in their in their first outing um, with this is to actually to replatform it. So we lift it, we tweak it a little bit, and, and then we shift it. Um, number four, obviously enough, is, is my, my favorite English euphemism, refactor or re-architect. That means rewrite it. Um, we, we've, we, we all know what that means, but it means to rewrite it or to rewrite a significant portion of it to ensure that it works where it's going to land. Um, this is why it's critically important that as you go on this journey, you are going to have apps that you want to move and, and some of those apps are going to need to be refactored, re-architected, rewritten. And when you do that, think long and hard if where you're rewriting it for is going to be where you want it in three or five years. What I mean by that is, don't be Kroger. Don't write to, to a standard that then ends up being your competition. So, and, and this again comes back to, to, to why I'm, I was so adamant that we, we partner with, with um, uh, VMware and, and Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. When you land there, you have the portability, the flexibility, and the luxury of being able to move it somewhere else if the underlying infrastructure no longer works for you for whatever reason, whether that be 
political, competitive, commercial, religious, whatever it happens to be. Obviously enough, you will hopefully uh, run into a few applications that you can retire. Um, often those, those will go hand in hand with the ones that get refactored. And then there will be some um, that you'll have to retain. And most likely those will be the ones that are sitting on mainframes and you will get to them. We, we have customers that, that have gone through everything, got to the mainframe and said, took a deep breath and said, okay, we, we need to do this. You will get, uh, get to those, but in the meantime, don't be afraid to say, we can't move this now. Again, evolution, not revolution. Revolutions are bloody. Don't be on the other end of a revolution. Um, we've got a number of, of, uh, of ways to help you with this, obviously enough. We put together the, the, this partnership with Palo Alto and with VMware. Um, we've, we have experts across the board that will help you, you know, truly simplify what you're doing, whether it's security, whether it's uh, uh, how you're going to address infrastructure for those folks who say, look, I need to, to sit in, in hybrid mode because I don't know um, how things are gonna shake out um, for the business, either uh, from a scalability or a governance point of view. Um, we certainly are ready from the very beginning to help you um, with the migration and figure out um, which applications are going in and, what, uh, and in what order. And then on the far end of that, as we move through our evolution, uh, we have folks to help you uh, start to break things down into, into microservices, again, when you're ready and when it makes sense for your business. So with that, I, I will see if there are any questions from anybody. Robert, there was one question I thought that somebody had sent in earlier. Yeah. Yep. So uh, someone was asking, how can I get more technical training webinars on these applications? Okay, that, that's a great question. So um, it's a great question, but, it, but it's a how long is a piece of string question. So if anybody is saying, okay, well, I want more information on X, whether that's Kubernetes, whether it's uh, Palo Alto security, whether it's how the integration between Tanzu and vSphere works, uh, reach out to your um, uh, reach out to your salesperson, or, or certainly reach out to me directly. And with the specific type of training, um, the specific subject that you're after, and we can point you in the right direction. There, there's both online training, um, there's free training, and and we of course have access to to uh, uh, partners that do uh, you know classrooms such as it is uh, under the circumstances training as well. And any I don't questions? see, no, I don't see any other questions. All right, well, then I will thank everybody very much for joining us on this Friday afternoon. Um, if a question does come up, again, please reach out to your, your CDW contact or feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Robert, maybe you can put my, um, in the chat, you can put my email address, glenn.gerard at cdw.ca. And I'm happy to find you the uh, the right resource or or help you directly myself.